Hey, welcome to the Butterfly Empire. It is me, your Butterfly Queen. And we are here to cover something very, very special. Some of y'all may have heard of it. Some of y'all may have not. And that's okay. Because that's why I'm here. I'm here to let you learn all about it. All the little nooks and crannies. And that is okay. So come and join us on this butterfly empire. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Wonderful, wonderful rainy day over here. So, if you can't tell, I found my microphone finally. Yeah. Hopefully it's sound better. So, today... We are doing the body in room 348. Now, before I tell the story, let's play a little game. <sighs> I want y'all to see if y'all can figure it out in your head, or write it down, write the clues, whatever. And see if you can solve what happened to this man before it actually happened. And I'll tell you the actual reason that he died. Okay? So. Give y'all a minute to get your pen, paper, crayon, notebook, whatever. A piece of paper. Or just write it on your hand. I don't, I don't really care. Type it. Whatever you see fit. Okay. The corpse at the elegant hotel is diamond. The Beaumont, Texas police. They could find no motive for the killing of a popular oil and gas man, Greg Flanagan, and no explanations for how he had received his strange eternal injuries. Bent on tracking down his killer, Flanagan's widow, Susan, turned to a private investigator, Ken Brennan, the subject of a previous stories. Hmm, so he solved a lot of them. Okay, once again. Once again, as Mark Bowden reports, it was Brennan's sleuthing that cracked the case. Okay. Gren Flanagan traveled light and left tidy. After so many years on the road, he would leave his rolling suitcase open on the floor of his hotel room and use it as a drawer. Dirty clothes went on the closet floor. Shirts he wanted to keep unwrinkled hang above. Jewelry trees were in the pockets of a cloth folding case that hooked onto a towel rack in the bathroom. At the end of the day, he would slide off his warm brown leather boots, line them up by the suitcase, drop his faded jeans to the floor, put on lightweight cotton pajama bottoms. Most evenings, he never left the room. He would crank up the air conditioner. He liked a cool room at night, like the coldest setting possibly. And sit on the bed, leaning back on two pillows propped against his headboard, considerately to avoid soiling the bedspread. He would lay out a clean white towel on which he placed his ashtray, cigarette pack, lighter, blackberry, the TV remote, and a candy bar. He smoked and broke off candy bits while watching TV. This is where Greg was on the evening of Wednesday, September 15th, 2010, in room 348 of the MCM Elegant Hotel in Beaumont, Texas. Lounging, smoking, snacking on Reese's Crispy Crunchy Bar. Sipping root beer and watching Iron Man 2. Let's just say he missed the ending. Greg was accustomed to solitary nights. As a young man, he had worked as a chief engineer on OSHA-going vessels, spending months at sea. In middle age, he had reinvented himself as a landman, a familiar occasion in South Texas, easing the exploration of mineral Rights on private properties for gas and oil companies. Slender, with a close-cropped white beard and weather skin of a long-line outdoorsman, he had partnered with his brother, Michael, in a thriving oil land leasing business based in the small city of Houston. Every morning morning, he would make two-hour drive in his pickup from Lafayette, Louisiana, heading west on Interstate 10 through scruffy Gulf Shore farmland, broken only by cell phone towers oil derricks, and billboard advertising motel chains, bayou restaurants, adult superstores, and other local attractions. It took him through the stink of the big 
Conato Films Refinery, a Lake Charles, a forest of piping, giant tanks, and towering chimneys. The hotel was off the club relief outside Baymont. His company rented him a room in the cabana, a three-story wing that wrapped around a small swimming pool framed by potted plants. That Wednesday night, though, watching his movie, Greg got an email from his wife, Susie, shortly after 7. Susie was using a computer program to file for a tax extension. After she reported her progress, he wrote back, You're doing good, babe. At some point during the loud computer-generated showdown, at the end of the film, amid all the fake violence, Greg was struck from nowhere with a really shattering blow. A blow so violent it would blind a man with pain. He managed to get off the bed and move towards the door, but he fell. Legs splayed and face first. So. The thing is, before this, uh, at like 7.25, I want to say, uh, the lights in the whole building went out. And so he called the super, and they fixed it. Well, the lights came on around 7.50, okay? Remember, he keeps his room really, really, really cold, lowest point he can. Well, the room was still pretty cold from when the lights went out, electricity, what do we call it? Lights, electricity, same thing. Lights went out, so then the room was still cold, so we, I'm guessing the... Electricity, when it came back on, it didn't kick the AC back on, so he couldn't really, you know, he didn't get up to turn the AC back on, because it was still cool. So. Remember that. But he was probably dead by the time his face hit the green rug. So. The following morning, Susie Flanagan called Greg's office. Husband and wife usually spoke every morning, but he hadn't called. He wasn't answering his phone. When he failed to turn up the office, one of his two co-workers drove over to the hotel and knocked on his door. There was no answer, so they got the hotel manager to open it. Their alarmed calls brought an ambulance and a Baymont police. They found a middle-aged man dead on the rug, prone and double over. A spent cigarette cup delicately between the two stiff fingers of his left hand. Remember that, left hand. Room 348 was stuffy and exceptionally warm. Remember, he kept his rooms cold. The man's skin color had gone grayish blue. There was a wet spot on the crotch of his blue pajamas. But that wasn't unusual. Detective Scott Apple showed up a little more than an hour later. He is short and very fit man with gray hair that was where, where he comes straight up into spikes. He is all cop. His wife had been a cop. He met her on the job. He was one of the assaulting leaders on the department's SWAT team. He is one of the men who never stop working. But there was a little here to interest him. No signs of break-in or struggle. Nothing disturbed in the room. No blood or obvious wounds. Flintkin's wallet was still in the back pocket of his jeans. and had a stack of hundred bills in it. Hundred dollar bills in it. So robbery wasn't the issue. So, when Scott Apple pretty much came in... He saw that there was no blood anywhere and that there was no obvious marks on him. He had a scrape on his cheek uh, and a scratch on his crotch. Because when he fell, you know, it looked like he just stood up, fell to his knees, and then went face first. You know, and his cigarette, his arm that was in cigarette was in his left hand, and that arm got turned up underneath him. Cigarette still in his, between his two fingers, you know? So. Pretty much those staying nearby in the nearby rooms had heard nothing. As Apple questioned the neighbors, he told them it was a possibly natural cause thing, you know? Sad. He poked around in Fleckin's bag, looking for mostly the four pills, some clues to his collapse. There was none. Susie and Michael later told him that Greg never went to a doctor. He was a stubborn, independent man, suspicious of authorities, and moved unmoved by the modern passion for health and fitness, which, like mainly every man that I've ever known in my life, <sighs> oh, you think you're dying? Now let's stay home. It'll get better by himself. Or, oh, we got, we need stitches? Eh, super glue it. It's fine. Anything to stop us from going to the doctors. Oh, we're not dying yet. Shit. We're fine. We don't need to go to the doctor just to, you know, 
every single person, the man I've known has been that way. He did not exercise. He had chain smoked his entire adult life and had the nagging cough to prove it. He neither drank nor ate to excess, but did both freely. It was easily to conclude that his choices had simply caught up with him. Susie was ready to believe it. She was shocked and grief-stricken by the she accepted that, for Greg's sudden death was a possibility. In fact, she took some solace into it. He had checked out in his own terms. Many times she had heard him remark upon hearing of someone's dying suddenly, Lucky bastard, that's how I want to go. And so he had. So they thought. So, let's take a quick moment to get the clues in order. Right? Okay. AC was still off. There was no struggle of a break-in. There was no blood. No neighbors heard or saw anything. There was no money missing. There was uh, no money taken, so robbery is not in the question. Could it be natural causes? I don't know. Let's continue listening, shall we? So, Scott Apple believes natural causes like heart attack, stroke, so does his wife and his co workers. They all pretty much believe, you know, it was natural causes. He didn't eat right, uh, chain smoke, pretty much all the simple stuff, you know. They thought it caught up to him. So, at the hotel, the police saw death as routine. For the robber snapped pictures to make record of the scene, and the body was driven by a transport service to the Jefferson County Medical Examiner for an autopsy. The only mystery here appeared to be medical, and was likely a minor mystery at that. Dr. Tommy Brown had time-tested method. It took him 45 minutes, conducted a post-mortem exam, inspecting a body inside and out, measuring the weighing organs, all while describing that he found and noted the metrics that fleshed out the official form. He was all business, crisp, efficient, and confident. Brown was thin and bald on top and had a spray of unusual white hair on the side that gave off a mad scientist vibe. He did everything fast. He was even talking fast. He was a local character, part of the legal landscape in Jefferson County, and a respected one. Where death was concerned, the coroner, of Texas, Dr. Tommy Brown's words was law. The circumstances of Greg Flanagan's death, as reported, was unremarkable. On the table before him was a 55-year-old man, Caucasian male, who appeared to be in decent shape. After meth after inspection, sorry about that, my brain went. Ooh. The only marks Brown found on the body was one inch abrasion on his left cheek where his face had hit the rug and curiously a half inch laceration on his scrotum, which is weird. That was interesting, I guess. The sack itself was swollen and discolored and around the wound was a small amount of edema fluid. The bruising had spread up through the groin and across the right hip. Something had hit him hard. Ooh. The story his body told grew more intriguing. When Brown opened the front of the torso, he discovered a surprising amount of blood and extensive eternal damage. A certain amount of partly digested food had been torn into from his intestines. The doctor found small lacerations there, and on the stomach and liver also, as two broken ribs, a hole in the right atrium of his heart. But think about that. There was no break-in. Nobody was trying to steal anything. He only had a mark on his face from when he fell. But somehow, some way, his junk was bruised and all the way up. His insides were torn to shreds. Blood everywhere inside his torso, where it's not supposed to be. Uh, what was it? His intestines were tore the fuck open. There was also lacerations on the stomach and the liver, two broken ribs, 
and a hole in the right part of his heart, hence where the blood came from. The condition of his insides reflected severe trauma. Flanagan had been beaten to death or crushed. Brown concluded that the wound to his genitals likely had been caused by a hard kick. He also taken a blow to the chest so severe it caused lethal damage. He would have bled out in less than 30 seconds. Mm. Y'all got that written down? Remembered it? Okay, there might be some more. I'll let y'all have a minute. Well, come on, write it down. Figure it out. Put all the clues together. Because that's all you're getting right this second. So pause the podcast. And then I'll pause. When you're ready. I'll be here waiting. Okay, you ready? I got more information. So, pretty much... They changed it from natural causes to homicide. Manslaughter kind of shit. Right? Because there's no possible way that your own body can practically implode itself and just crush your whole organs. Impossible. So, that moves on to the who done it and why. But the thing is. They went back to the room, right? Why don't you go look for more clues or something, anything? Well, they looked at the maintenance log. The detective, you know, Apple guy. Well, they found out that uh, Greg was making popcorn that night. In his microwave. Cool, you're watching a movie. Yeah, let's do that. Little snack snack with popcorn and movie. Yeah. So, anyways, he blew a fuse. Hence why the lights went out earlier. He didn't know that he killed all of the electricity to everybody. Not just him. Okay, so. Now we're at the maintenance span, right? Okay. There's two theories. One theory you know, guy went down, flipped the breaker, fixed the lights, and then he went upstairs and just murdered him. Or, second theory. Also, don't forget, maintenance man had a bad record. But then they came to realization, the maintenance man wouldn't do that. There, there was no logical reason for the maintenance man to do that. You know, he just does his job. And so another theory was 349. There was these two guys, they were electricians, they were drunks, you know, parter years. They thought that maybe, you know, they came out of the room and they saw Greg and they were like in a drunken rage and just went, ah, let's beat the shit out of him for some god awful reason. I don't know. But you gotta roll everybody out. You know, they had to find a who or what and one why, and this is the best model they had so far. So, Mr. Apple here, Apple dude, we should call him, <laughs> he put on a little, you know, camera camera on his clothing, and they went to go interview him, you know? So, when he figured out, you know, what happened, they talked to him, and they were like, Hey, yo, we we're respectful, we we're polite, we we're actually pure curious of what actually happened to Greg in 348. You know, they were sneaky or hiding anything. So. Like, we had no interaction with this dude, came home, we heard him coughing, you know. But that's about the extent of our interaction with him, you know? So at this point, you know, the electricians were like, hey, here's my phone number, here's my email, you need me, contact us, anything, you know, we really want to help you. So pretty much, the room wasn't telling nobody, the body wasn't saying nothing to them, he's dead, so we can't, but you know what I mean, the autopsy didn't say nothing. 
nobody said anything, nobody heard nothing, blah, blah, blah. Case went cold. So, seven months later, my dudes. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, Detective Applebottom mainly for explanation. The doctor told him the man in 348 had suffered the kind of severe injuries. He was more used to seeing crash victims or somebody found under a heavy fallen object. There was not many murders in Baymont. Greg was one of ten that year, which was average. Most are not mysterious. Detective work was usually a matter of doing the obvious, interviewing the drunk boyfriend with the gunpowder on his hands, or finding a neighbor drug dealer who was owed money. A case like this was once in every career event. If you, if you enjoyed working a stubborn who didn't, which Apple does, then this one was exactly challenging. The problem was they were very hard. Over the next weeks, Apple chased on every angle you can imagine to explain the death of Greg Frenikin. But about six months into it, seven months, he was stuck. Physical X didn't add up unless Greg had been beaten to death elsewhere and his body had been returned to the room, carefully placed on the rug. Nothing about the scene added up to the crime. How does a man get so severely beat up that ribs crack, inner organs tear, and the heart ruptures all without seeing any significant damage to his torso? Other than the bruising and cut on his crotch, Flanagan's outer body showed no signs of beating, and how could such a rumble have taken place in a hotel room without a thing being toppled or even disturbed? Nobody heard anything. And there was no one to all important question. Why? Greg appeared to have no enemies. Apple talked to a lot of to Susie, she had been in her 20s, a singer in a rock band. When she met Greg, she clearly adored him. Susie was a delightful, offbeat Southern belle. Buxom and pretty and warm and oh, so differential. But also, in that time, honored Southern way. Stubborn as a tick. She was heartbroken and furious at the time. You know, Greg was the best man she ever met. He was so nice. She had married him twice. First just kid, and then, after parting ways for a number of years, again in middle age. When Susie first called him again after the separation, he said, I've been waiting for you to call. They had been married to the second time for 15 years. His brother and co-worker said he had been universally liked in the company. His life intersected with, you know, pretty much, let me just rephrase that. He was great, great guy. He went to his room early in that evening, usually stayed there by himself until morning. You know, good staying. Greg had never been seen down at the bar. He did not socialize or drink a lot, pick up women. So he was not a drunk. This was not a flounder or a man getting into fights. This was a decent, honorable, smart, and successful man who people liked, you know. The sort of man nobody would murder, yet somebody had. Oh, the fall. And into the winter of 2010, Apple pursued a number of possibilities. Maintenance records showed at some point early in the evening of the death while cooking prepackaged popcorn. We already covered that. So, more theories, more thoughts. The first involving sex. The maintenance man happened to have a rap sheet of a sex offender. There you go. Why the puncture room to the scrotum and injuries in recent mm, mm. have been caused by... Excuse you, phone. A long screwdriver and some sort of bizarre and kinky assault. Apple spent a lot of time make, talking to the maintenance man in his background, but the theory never advanced beyond all suspicion. The theory involved a group of union electrician staying the night that Greg died. They were in town, you know, for instance, they were doing a job for an oil company. At night, they tended to assemble them. And others' room to drink. Maybe one of them have knocked on Greg's door and perhaps drunk and annoyed, exchanged word with them, and assaulted him in the hallway. Could Greg badly beat and have returned to his room and then collapsed? Some of the electricians have been questioning on the day the body was found, but none of them had interactions with the man in 348. Nine days after Greg's death, Apple and a colleague returned to the third floor cabana wing. To question some of the same men again, Apple was wearing a hidden video game. There you go. You know, they asked him, what's wrong? What happened? Mr. Apple was like, hell, I don't know. 
that's what I'm trying to find out. It's almost like something fell on him or something. He was just trying to see if somebody heard something or maybe someone knows something. You know, anything. They had nothing to offer. But there was nothing in any of these rooms heavy enough to do anything. Down the hall, they found three more of the electricians. One said that when he had seen the body on the gurney in the elevator, he had first assumed they were caterers delivering a cake or big food tray. That's a better thought, Mr. Apple said. Mm, weeks went by, months went by. Apple worked any theory he could imagine. He considered the possibility that Susan had had her husband killed. He considered Mike Flanagan, Greg's brother and partner. There was nothing even hinting either of the person. Who doesn't love a mystery solved? Mm. It creates order from disorder, styles from aches for moral balance. An unsolved mystery is like a stone in the shoe. That is where the case of the body, room 348, was by the end of 2010. Scott Apple was stymied, stuck. Hoping to unearth something new in November, the family had put up a $50,000 reward. It pronounced nothing. Michael hired a private detective from Houston, a former FBI agent. Apple met with a man and reviewed the case. That was the last he saw of him. The matter of Greg Finnegan was bound for the cold file. It would have been just another sad box of notes and evidence stoned in the Jefferson County Courthouse. So let's bring in a fresh pair of eyeballs. Because, you know. You can't figure it out. It's okay for somebody else to look at it. Maybe they can give you a good perspective or a different one. So Ken Brennan took Susie's call on the golf course. She was surprised that he picked up his phone to himself. Ken Brennan speaking. Oh my God, you don't have a secretary? She was flustered. The detective had answered on the first ring. She could barely get the story out. Greg's death. The coroner's finding. The dead end. He asked her to send him some files. He took a look. She says she's been feeling under the weather. But she... We'll try to pull together and see what she had prompt up and send it off to him. Well, said Brennan, you need to fucking take care of yourself. Like everyone, everything Brennan says, that came in a thick New York accent and a voice that sounds like it's strained through a cubic yard of gravel. It was a no bullshit, you better listen to me command that was all more starting, startling because he had said something tender. It endeared him to Susie immediately. Brennan is former Los Angeles cop, a DEA special agent, who now makes a good living as a private detective in Florida. That's why he was on the golf course in February. He is pushing 60, still solid, and always tan and stylish in South Florida. Manner. Blue-eyed, thick neck, and regularly handsome. He is partially to lightweight short sleeves that show off his torso and big arms. You know, the shirts that make you... that are too tall, too small for you. He wears flashes of gold on his neck and wrist and Irish rings on several fingers. Brennan's hair is mostly white now and is combed straight back on the sides and straight up in front in a low-key pompadour. Cocky, but dignified. Months earlier, not long after Greg was killed, a young lawyer friend, Kia Sherman, had told Susie and Michael about Brennan. Sharing Susie's frustration with the investigation, she had hit up the strategy of filing a lawsuit against the hotel as means pursuing the prob probe privately. She had read an article by News by Mac, The Case of Vanishing Blonde, December 2010, detailing Brennan's remarkable success in resolving a 2005 cold case in Miami. Now when the investigation seemed homeless, hopeless, Sherman brought up Brennan again. If you want to do something, she said, you have to go to this guy, the one I told you about, just find him. Brennan can be readily found on the internet, it's just asking to take more cases than he can handle. People came to him with unsolved murders and disappearances. It takes these people seriously and handles them gently. So, when he reads a file, he's looking for a case that intrigues him, but also one where he thinks he might be able to accomplish something. I ain't in the business of giving people false hope, he says. But the case, it appealed to him because of the mystery. But also, before, there were so many avenues to explore. Greg's family and co-workers, hotel guests, the maintenance man... The Detective Apple, none of my leads seemed fresh anymore. To Brennan, they were all new and potentially promising. He knew that a fresh pair of eyes would 
perhaps the most valuable things he brought to the investigation. So, Detective Apple couldn't figure it out. Let's see if this guy can. So, pretty much when Brennan was talking to the wife, he was like, okay, think real hard. Is there anything that you could possibly tell me that was out of place, not like him, you know, any small thing that you think would not mean a thing? She was like, yeah. There was a few things. One, the AC was off. And he always, oh, always had the AC on. You know, he kept the room freezing as cold. Like, no matter where he slept, he could not sleep without it being cold. No matter where he was, who is he with, or anything like that. So cold, always. So his co-workers found him. The AC was off, extremely stuffy in that room. Okay, then Brandon went home, made arrangements for a second trip to Baymont. Apple came out to a sports bar late to meet him. The two men ate and talked. Brandon told Apple what he always tells the cops he meets in the work. Listen, I'm not a maverick. I don't do things half-cocked ass. If I decided we're going to do this, we're going to do this as a team. There's nothing I'm going to do that you're not going to know about. There should be nothing that you're going to do that I don't know about. The one thing is I won't fuck up your case. I've been doing this a long time, but also know that you're the guy in charge here, so it's your case. Part of what's going on in Brennan checked out Apple. I don't want to work with somebody I don't like, he told me. He prides himself on being able to read people very quickly. He likes it. He liked the, the Vermont detective, who's mutual, as Apple will like to put it later. Ken has good people skills. The following morning, Apple picked up Brennan and visited a hotel room where Apple showed him crime scene photos and the autopsy reports and he reviewed it he had done over the previous seven months brendan heard him out and then announced i think i know how this guy died i think i know when he died i think i know who killed him and i think i know i i think we know how we're going to catch him come on said apple hear me out i'll tell you what i think but first i gotta call the guy's wife so he called susie's cell phone he was like, your husband, was he left-handed or right-handed, he asked. He was right-handed, you know, smoked his cigarettes in his right hand, wrote with his right hand. And when he smoked, did he smoke with a cigarette in his left hand or his right hand? He always smoked with his right hand. You sure? I'm positive. Brennan hung up and explained his conclusions to Apple. Susie had already told him how cold Greg kept his room. This helped fix the time of death. As Brennan saw it, the air conditioner had shut down with everything else but the circuit breaker blowing. The time was known. Hotel records show that the repairman had left Greg alive and well around 8.30 p.m. The movie resumed and apparently Greg forgot to clip, flip on the AC. It would have taken a few minutes for the room to grow warm enough for him to notice. And by the time he had, he was dead. That's why he'd been found in a warm room. As Brennan put it in September, it's hot as fuck in Vermont, Texas. The cigarette scrolled the notion that Greg had been beaten several, severely somewhere else, perhaps even just out in the hall, and then returned to 348. A hallway scenario might explain why nothing had been disturbed in his room, but the cigarette ruled that out. There was no way Greg's attacker returned to him would have even added the fine touch of cupping one hand around his body and delicately placing a burning cigarette between his fingers. Remember, when he was laying down, the cigarette was still between his fingers. It was also unlikely, given the ruptured atrium of his heart, that Greg would have had time to re return to the room after such a getting beaten calmly light up before kneeling over. Most likely, Greg had lit a cigarette before. Whatever happened to him happened. If Greg was right-handed, why was a cigarette found in his left hand? Make sure you write that down. Cigarette was found left-handed. As Brennan pieced it together, examining the state of the room, Greg had gotten up from the bed and headed towards the door, shifting the cigarette to his left hand in order to grab the doorknob with his right hand. It was hard to see this make sense, but Brennan, Brennan had learned to be patient. It was a mistake to let what you do not know race around you, ahead of what you do. Crime was a puzzle. If there was even one small piece that did not fit, the puzzle was incomplete. 
so he willingly to follow the evidence's unlikely directions. Greg could not have been beaten to death in his room, the evidence suggested, and yet he had died there. He had died quickly after sustaining his wound. Somehow, that was... We know what happened. Greg had been quietly minding his own business just even seconds before he was killed. This is what led to the electricians who were close. The room had been partially blacked out by the blown circuit at the same time Greg had been. So all of the scenarios Apple had considered, this was one that made most sense. The Union guys may have well been drunk, but they may have confronted Greg in the doorway of his room, exchanged words, and kicked him to death right there. He asked Apple if he had interviewed them. Yeah, they were nice. See anybody hanky? No, no, no. I'm sure if they were drinking, they had to talk about it to each other, so someone knows about them, probably one or two of their close friends. I'm sure if they drink and they had to talk to each other, blah, blah, blah. They next paid a visit to Dr. Brown Ken. The coroner wanted to know if the injuries Brown had might have been caused by severe beating. They might have, the doctor said. The laceration on the scrotum could have been caused by a hard kick, especially if they say they had been wearing steel-toed boots. The Tristan Dexter wore construction boots. He returned home to continue inspecting the hotel surveillance, but it was time consuming work and not particularly helpful. He calls it looking to see that to and fro. Camera showed that Greg came in from work that evening. It showed several of the electricians making trips to their vehicles in the parking lot, but then nothing obviously suspicious. So when Brennan returned to Beaumont, Beaumont in late May, he and Apple went to see some of the co workers who had not yet been interviewed. By this time, the Union electricians had been gone for several months. Apple's effort with the co-workers had been uncovered nothing. So, let's go through the clothes we know already. 8.30. Lights come back on. Doesn't kick the AC on. TV cans back on. So he's just laying there in bed, you know, watching TV. Doesn't realize it's getting warm in the room. And it's going to get warm in there pretty quick, okay? So we know electricity comes back. 8.30. And so about 9.15 when the room starts getting really warm. So somewhere between 8.30ish to 9.15, this man died. Okay? Okay. We know this. This is our timeline. We know he died. How? We don't know. When, where, who, when, we still don't know that. But now we know something. That's what matters. So, at this point, they're like, you know what? We want to believe that he was beaten. All signs lead to him being beaten. You know? But. What if it's not? You know? Just keep following, you know? And remember, he always smoked with his right hand. And when he was found, the cigarette was in left hand. So, clues now. Pretty much. Electricity comes back on. 8.30. TV comes back on. So he goes to lay back down in bed, watch TV. We know that. He lights up a cigarette, puts it in his right hand. Then something happens, which we'll get to later. He, switch, he gets up out of bed, puts a cigarette in left hand, walks towards the door. Then he falls over. Okay, we got that. So, when Brennan returned to Beaumont in late May, They went to see some of the co-workers who had not been interviewed. By this time, the union and other chosen had been gone for several months. Apple's effort with the co-workers have uncovered nothing. But Brennan was convinced that it was worthwhile. Human nature being what it was, if any of the electricians knew something about Greg's death, word would have it spread. 
So they made their rounds. Yes, most of the men had heard about the men who died in the elegant hotel. What a shame. Did not know nothing or anything that happened to him. As Brandon will remember it later on, one of the crew foremen, a man named Aaron Bargo, had heard something about a gun going off in the boarding house. No, Albert correct him. That was not the same case. This was the one where a man got in a fight at the Elegant Hotel. Barbara heard nothing about that. As they drove from the Barcue's house, Brennan said, We need to go back to the hotel. What are we going back there for? Everything's been checked out. We're going to look for a bullet. Mmm. In room 348, they began expecting the floor, the furniture, the wall, everything. They were both working on their hands and knees, shining flashlights underneath the furniture. They found nothing. Brandon was frustrated because he was now convinced that somehow a gun had been involved. They were about to get up when they noticed an intention, an indention in the wall along the closet door that led into the adjoining room. The indentation was a repair job. Oh, snap. It appeared to be right where the handle of the door would hit the wall. Typically, hotel rooms wear and tear. But when he swung the door open, the knob and the dent didn't quite match up. Oh, shit. So, put that in your notes. Dent in the wall. That has been fixed and covered up. There's a hole in the wall adjacent with the rooms, you know? Okay, let's take a look at the other side of the wall. When they got to the hotel security guy to let in the room 349, there was no mistaking what they found on the wall there. Brennan stood along the small, neat hole in the wall that had been punched with a dab of flanky pit filler that turned out to be dry toothpaste. He measured its height against his hip, then went back to 348 and measured the indentation. They lined up. A bullet had gone through the wall. The small, neat hole in 349 made marked its entry. The larger hole in 348, its exit. Oh, shit! So now we have bullet holes in the wall. So, they call in a dude. The examiner and, uh, so they go into 349. They get the laser. They shine it through the hole. And they see that the laser goes all the way through the wall, right? And it lands. The end of the laser lands where Greg would be sitting on his bed watching TV, smoking a cigarette, you know? So now we know this guy was shot. I mean, but the medical examiner guy Examine the body from head to toe. Cut him open, expecting his inner organs one by one. Reverse the expectations of the police. With preciseness and with the insight of years, he had determined that Greg Fling did die, not from natural causes, but a severe beating. Now they want to tell him that his careful and good observation was wrong? That he missed all those things? A bullet wound? Brandon volunteered to do a talk, and after he and Apple found a bullet hole, Trace the trajectory, the answer to the mystery of Greg's death was, he believed clear. But in order to act, in order to bring, bring Greg's killer or killer to justice, they would have to get the coroner to rewrite the findings. You could not argue in court that a defendant had shot someone in the medical examiner's office and had concluded that the guy also was not shot. Okay, Brown's office was a mess, papers, files, books everywhere. Every available surface was buried even to the floor. They cleared away space on two chairs to sit down. When they mentioned that they were working the flink in the case, the doctor said, Oh, did you cuss the guy to beat him up? No, we're not there yet. So, trying to tell me that this man was shot. But the coroner says, I'm telling you, this guy wasn't shot. But, you know, of course, they couldn't go back and look at the body because he's been cremated. 
and the ovens were hot enough to destroy metal fragments. Listen, Doc. Let's just take the photos from the autopsy and go through them see what we can find. Brown humored them, of course. As they looked through the photographs, passing them back forth across the desk, Brennan pointed out things. What about this here? Indicating a spot of damage. Yes, that's the liver. And what about this here? Yes, that's the intestines. So Brennan knew what he was looking at. The bullet had entered Greg's scrotum and tore up through him. The skin of the scrotum was soft and pliable and it folded over the entry room. Oh my god. Huh. Huh, huh, huh. So Zwinky was hiding in the entry wound. In other words, making it less obvious than what it was. The eternal has traced the bullet's fatal trajectory, Bernard said. Doctor, could all this done by blunt force trauma? But could also a bullet do the same? Yes, it could, but that's not what's happened here. This man was beaten. Okay, da. But could it have? Jeez, just answer me. Brandon found something in the photo that supported his argument. It looked like a track. You could get the same thing from being beaten. Then you get to the heart. Brown passed the photo to the detectives. Doc, what? That's a bullet hole, Doc. Brown took the photo. What? That's a fucking bullet hole. Brown exclaimed that something... Brown exclaimed that sometimes when a man is kicked or hit with a blunt object in the chest, it is the right atrium that normally burst. Doc, that's a fucking bullet hole. Brown looked again. Yep, that's a bullet hole. After a long moment, he added, the media is going to kill me for this. Okay, this is the ending part, so... We know the... What killed him? How he was killed where he was killed but the who and the why is what we're about to figure out so So, Tim Schneesman must have been feeling pretty okay about his meeting with the Texas cops. Getting called had been a shocker. It was more than seven months since he and Lance had come home from the job in Baltimore. Beaumont, my bad. Wow. Which, these are two guys that were electricians next door. Just to remind you. Now, two cops from down there had come all this way to Wisconsin to see him and to question him about the guy who had died next door. It had been worrisome. He and M Mueller had conferred about it, and before him by phone, and made sure their stories were straight. Sidemen met the detectives in an interview room in the Chippewa County Sheriff's Department, and really, they thought they could not have been more nicer. Tim sat in a swivel chair on one side of the big wooden table, and they sat opposite with him, and then notebooks open, files handy, you know, very official. They thanked them for coming, they assured him that this was routine. And they had walked him through evening, asking a lot of questions. We answered dignity, tried to remember every detail, leaving out the part about the gun, of course. But the detectives had not pushed him at all. You heard that guy next door died, right? They were like, we did hear that, but we really don't know for what's going on. We had no idea. We didn't hear no commotion next door, no banging, no nothing. That's why this is kind of weird. They wrote out the statement, and that's it, huh? That's Trisha next. That's it. So, you guys feel the way out here for that? They go through the statement, read it out loud, and make any corrections he wanted. Steimer knows that Apple had been put down that he was apprentice, so he changed that to journeyman. A few other things, he initialed all the places where he had made change. <laughs> then they brought in a local cop to notarize the statement right there in front of him. So, is that it? Hang on a second. His tone was different now. Harsh. It was until you signed the statement. Now you've got a problem. Okay? He sat down again. Now tell us what really happened. Because we know what happened. Because now, you're going to jail with him. Do you want to go to jail with Lance? You just made a false police report. 
him. We know what happened. We know everything that happened down there. And I realize you are trying to be a noble and protective of friend, but you're about to get the whole family in a bind. And it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. So just tell us what happened. So, here comes the whole story. So, corroborated later that same day, June 1st, 2011, in the interview, we had been in 349 with them. Between the two accounts, the following scenarios emerged. They had been drinking beer, Mueller X, Hassan Hassan out to fetch a bottle of whiskey from his car, and they also bring up his pistol, a 9mm Ruger. Once on a return, Mueller took out the handgun to the other's alarm, started playing with it. He pointed it at Steismet, who dropped to the floor and cursed at him. And when he was pointing it into Hassan's direction at the foot of the bed, when it went off, Hassan thought for a second that he had been hit, but then turned to see a hole in the wall behind him. Mueller freaked out, and they both said Mueller bundled up the gun and took it back out to his car. When he returned, Fasano had left for his own room, disgusted. Mueller and Sismus had went downstairs to the bar. They had not known for sure that there was anyone staying in the room next door until, as he remembered, they heard someone in the room coughing very late after midnight. When they came back from the bar, he held nothing back. Steismus' second statement, the truthful one, laid out the whole thing. It was good to get off his chest when he and Mueller had been seeing the police at room 348 the next morning and had seen the gurning. They were disturbed. I thought he had killed the guy. The only detail that didn't fit was this business of hearing a cough behind the closed door of room 348. When the two returned from the bar for several reasons, neither Brennan nor Apple was inclined to place much weight on it. If it's true, then Greg had survived the gunshot for far longer in the corner believed possible, but it was not until after the cause of death. If anything, it made the electrons fail to check in on him or call for help at all the more ingregorous. More likely is that they had heard Greg coughing in the room previous evening. They had been in the room next door to him the night, too. They were drunk. Fixing the cough late at night, Greg died was the only shred of their story that contradicted the detective's re reconstruction. And they clung to it, even though it hardly mattered. Did anybody knock on the door next door to check on this guy? Nope. I always ask myself, if it was a situation like this, you know, what would I do? And I admit, he never finished the thought. The detective had something else they wanted him to do. Hey, Lance, what's up? He dialed Mueller on the cell phone. Apple and Brennan were recording the conversation. Not much. Just sitting around. Well, I just got back going down from there. How'd it go? Well, I told him the whole story. You know what? What had happened that we're sticking to there, you know? What's that? You know, the story we we're sticking to that we got home late that night and, you know, the guy was coughing or whatever, right? And, uh, and I was fixing. I was going to leave there. Then your lawyer said it would be okay, right? You know? Right? And when I left there, they said, okay, you know what? Tell us the truth. So, you know, I told them the truth. What really happened? There was a long silence on the other end. About the gun going off and all that? Yep. What did they say? Well, that I'll be in trouble, you know, if I didn't tell them. More silence. So what did they say? Not much. I don't know if they're going to get a hold of you or Trent or what the hell you're going to do. Mueller sighed heavily. And then he groaned. Ugh. What did they mean by that? I mean, tell us the truth. Did they say anything about the gun prior to that or what? No, they just said they knew exactly what happened. Told me to stop effing lying. They were pretty pissed, and then I told them exactly everything went down, and really, truly, they're probably going to come to get your ass now. That they know the truth and everything. You should probably try to get some kind of effort, you know? The guy, he died from the gunshot. Are you shitting me, Tim? No, I'm not. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Are you serious right now? I'm serious a heart attack, Lance. You gotta refuse to believe it. For the next five minutes of the call, he ran around and around. His lawyer had obtained the autopsy report and assured him that the man had not died of a gunshot wound. The story had been all over the news. It doesn't make sense. If there was a gunshot, if he was killed from, you know, a firearm, they would have said something on the damn news. It doesn't make sense. First, the coroner ruled out the heart attack. And they're saying that the something fell on him. There's no way. There's absolutely no way this guy was killed by a bullet. 
How am I doing? Not good. I need to drink some more beers. You're drunk, Ben, I told him. I said you call a... I suggest you call an attorney. Brandon was right when the judge stated reading the sentence. He had flown to Bima October 29, 2012 to join Susie Flanagan and Scott Apple and a group of Greg's family and friends for the sentencing of Lance Mueller. The electrician had entered a no contest plea to manslaughter. As Brandon remembered it, the judge began by saying that this whole tragedy might be seen just as a terrible accident. Oh, fuck. Here it goes. Don't tell me this guy is going to get a year or something. But then the judge started cataloging the long list of willing for irresponsible choices that had led to this day. More like it, but The judge gave Mueller 10 years, half of what the law allowed. The apology Mueller offered in court, no matter how sincere, came too late. But this is what happens when you drunkenly play with a gun. They had suspected from the start that the air errant bullet had at least helped kill the man in 348. Even a heart attack, which had been the first assumption of the police, ruled his butt on the gurney. Might have been triggered by the gunshot. Then, after corner where Greg had died of blunt force trauma, Mueller was happy to accept that something might have crushed him to death. Even if it was hard to imagine that, still, he had been worried enough about the gunshot. He had himself patched the hole in the toothpaste. He had hidden the gun immediately in his car, then stashed it with a friend for a few days after the incident, and had then handed it over to his attorney for safekeeping before he left Texas. What a huge mistake. So. So, Susan Flanagan had a chance to speak to Mueller directly. I have waited over two years to look into your face, eye to eye, and simply have the chance to speak to you directly. You would never have come forward with the truth you murdered him, nor if you didn't initially seek him out to murder him. But you murdered him with every lie you told, with every initial selfish deception, with every cover-up over and over again. You saw his body taken out of that room, in a body bag the next day you knew you killed him it meant nothing to you that night in room 348 relaxing smoking watching iron man 2 greg flanagan could not have known what hit him in the moments before he died you have met your match said the small woman staring across the courtroom and had him a steady and controlled ferocity. I would have spent the rest of my life tracking you down when I found you. Greg's murderer. I brought you to justice. So, with that being said, what did y'all think of that? Did y'all expect what was going to happen? Did y'all know that was going to happen? I mean, no holes anywhere in his body, you know, not beat up or nothing. The thing is, though, if he was beaten before his death, those bruises, you know, would accumulate the blood from him dying, you know. Blood pool, pool, can I speak? Pulls into a certain spot, like his face when he smacked the ground, his face. The pile there, pulled there, whatever. But the groin thing, I couldn't figure out how that got there, you know? I, I couldn't. If you'd have known that his groin was all bruised and all that stuff, so. I didn't even see that coming. So, here you guys go. Hope you guys enjoyed.